for that. Maybe you've been around those kind of people. The kind that would sit and be in a difficult circumstance and then spin it to where, it, oh, it, it's all positive. It's all good. It makes you wonder about Paul. He's sitting in prison. Maybe he's one of those glass half full kind of guys. Maybe he's one of those guys that uh, is always upbeat, always positive. See, I've never met Paul, but I, I don't get that from Paul in his writings, but maybe he was. Maybe, he, maybe he'd taken a Dale Carnegie course. Maybe uh, he'd, he'd read the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. Maybe he was one of those kind of guys. Maybe he knew how to win friends and influence people. I mean, there's a possibility of that. As we read this passage, as you know that we've been sitting in Philippians, it's a book of joy. He's sitting in prison. He's not where he's supposed to be. He's in Rome. He thought he would be in Spain or Iberia then. Last week, we discovered some things about this writer. Look with me, and let's read together once again Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 19 fascinating statements that he makes here. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Verse 15. It is true that some pe preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. <coughs> the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is, is that in every way, whether with false motive or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Verse 19. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. You know, that. remember last week that we have uh, been watching Paul's reaction and response to being in prison, and he talks about this. And Paul has uh, realized and he's expressed the fact that <coughs> folks are stirring up trouble. Oh, they're preaching Christ, but they're stirring up trouble, trying to make things more difficult for him out of envy. And we discovered last week there's a couple, three things, the way in which Paul responds to this. First of all, a lot of times we discovered that God is going to be about doing something when I least expect it. Paul didn't expect that something good would come out of him being in prison. But it's very clear, hey, listen, not only, hey, I'm not just out there preaching. Hey, it's not just one guy out there but God has now multiplied me because I'm here. See, God didn't do what Paul expected. He thought he was in prison, but in actuality, being in prison multiplied the ministry. God moved when he least expected it. Also, he also realized and expresses the fact that, hey, people are watching the way I respond to adversity in my life. People are watching how I respond to difficulty and trouble. And then he, he talks about the fact, the third thing he talks about is, is that he is going to focus, regardless if somebody's trying to make trouble for me, hey, I'm not going to pay attention to that. He basically says, listen, Jesus is being proclaimed, so I choose to rejoice. I'm rejoicing because regardless of, hey, good motive, bad motive, doesn't matter, Jesus is being 
told, talked about, proclaimed, expressed. Lives are being changed because truth is being spoken. And Paul says very clearly in verse 18, he says, at the very end, 18b, he says, and because of this, I rejoice. And because of this, what's the because of this? Because Christ is being proclaimed. He had a focus. His focus was, hey, Jesus is being proclaimed. We talked about that last week. And in spite of where he was at, Jesus was being proclaimed. In spite of the fact that everybody's watching me, and because they're watching me, they are now redoubling their efforts. They're getting encouraged, emboldened. In spite of the fact that I'm not where I want to be, where I not, I, I, I'm not where I thought I should be in my life, in my circumstance. I, I should be wandering around Iberia, having fun there. And see, a lot of times, I'll be honest with you, I, man, I understand his angst. I understand it's like, hey, listen, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I, see, I'm supposed to be somewhere outside the United States. See, you need to understand that about me. If I'm somewhere outside the United States, that's where, I, that's where I'm supposed to be. Paul was, I, hey, listen, I'm supposed to be in Iberia. I bet we've talked about this before. I'm supposed to be there, but now I'm stuck in a prison in Rome. Don't want to be in Rome. Hey, they don't need me in Rome. In spite of that, his life was not going the way he thought it should be or where he should be. And in spite of all that, here's what he says. He says, and because of this I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Now, there's something interesting about the two words rejoice. In the English, it's the same. And we put some other words in front of them to determine whether it's in the present tense or the future tense or the past tense. Tenses are, there's, are, are much more complex in the original language. They're, they're much more telling. And what's interesting is, is that this, this concept of rejoice, um, he says, yes, the first time he uses the word rejoice is in the present, and let me get a little technical, the present active indicative. Means present tense, right now. Active, that means Paul's the one doing it. He's the one rejoicing. And the indicative is, it's actually going on. Okay, it's indicating if we you know, would sort of translate it into our everyday language, because you probably don't often hear the concept of present active indicative. We don't talk that way. But that's what he's saying here. He's basically saying, and in this I rejoice. That means in this present moment, I'm writing this, or somebody's writing it for me, I'm rejoicing. I am the one doing the rejoicing, and it's actually happening. It's a real and present experience or activity. <coughs> The second time he uses this concept of, of rejoicing, look with me at the end of verse 18. And why, why in the Middle Ages, why did those monks split the verse there? Nobody knows. There's some mysteries that, you know, we just go, it shouldn't have been split there. I understand part of it, but he says, yes, and I will continue to rejoice at the end of verse 18. Yes, and I will continue to to rejoice. Now, the idea in the English, the continue, is a sec separate word, meaning that it's going to happen in the future. But in the original language, it is a future tense word. It's just one word, not two words. And it is in the future passive indicative. Very strange. It's not in the future active. In the future, I will act that way. It is that the action, the verb, is actually happening to him or it is happening through him. See, it's a huge difference. It's interesting. Present active, future passive. Meaning, Paul is not the one generating the action. It's going to happen later on. We know that. It's going to continue. But in the English, you can't see that this is an action that is going to happen to him or through him. Not by his own power. It's passive. I'm passively experiencing this. He is experiencing it. It is in the indicative. It is that this is going to be something that occurs. See, how is this going to happen? See, Paul is actively rejoicing in that moment. In the future, 
He will be passively rejoicing, meaning this activity is going to go on through me or to me. Something else is acting on or through Paul. Interesting, isn't it? Because the second time, it happens later. The second time, he's not the one in control. He's not the one doing the rejoicing. Now, I want you to note, if you will look at me in, in, verse, uh, in verse 19, let's read it again. He says, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. See, how does this future rejoicing happen to him or through him? How is that going to go on? Well, first off, we know that he believes that God's will is to deliver him. Now, you have to read in context. Understand, we can't just take it right then. Later on in the future verses, just shortly, a couple of verses later, he says, listen, whether I live or die, that's what he's talking about for deliverance, his salvation, if you will. He's going to be the salvation, it's actually the word salvation, his salvation or deliverance from prison will be either through, hey, they actually free me and I live, or they kill me and I'm delivered. He says it doesn't matter what that, what that is. So we'll sort of pull that back for a moment and see that Paul's deliverance Hey, he, he is not concerned whether it's going to be, hey, listen, I'm getting out of prison and God knows, yeah, you're getting out of prison. It may be breathing or it may not be. But he knows that God is going to deliver him. Something's going to happen. I may live, I may die. Doesn't really matter. He goes on and says, doesn't matter. One is good, the other is good. Actually, the other is better. Hey, listen, if I die, it's okay because I get to go be with Christ, which would be far better than sticking around with you people. But the issue is, the mentality and his understanding is, is that God is going to deliver him. There's a second thing here. There's a concept of cooperation that happens between the Philippians, God, and what occurs to Paul. Here's what he says. For I know that through your prayers, your intercession, your supplications to God, that salvation will occur. That, hey, my deliverance will occur. That I'm going to get out of this thing. Philippians, you're part of this. And you're part of my deliverance. Hey, regardless of what happens, doesn't matter. You're going to be part of this because you've been praying for me and God has heard you and God is going to move. So there's this cooperation that happens. But the rejoicing doesn't happen because of the power of the Philippians' prayer. So the active movement here in this passage is not the Philippians' prayer. That's not the thing that is creating the verb action in Paul rejoicing. The verb action in Paul rejoicing is, look with me in the passage, is that Verse 19, he says, And God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance, my salvation. So the pro provision, the active movement of God, look with me, of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Guess what's acting in this, in this sentence? Guess who's doing the verbal action? Guess who's creating the rejoicing in that future moment passively in and through Paul? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. See, there are going to be times in our lives when we cannot, are not able to rejoice. You're going to have circumstances. It might be a death of a loved one. It might be a circumstance where I flunked that test. It might be a, a, a situation where my business is going under. It might be a thing where, hey, listen, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be, but I'm here. You see, it's the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ in and through Paul, regardless of what happens, Regardless of his circumstance, in spite of the fact that, hey, people are against him, doesn't matter what's happening, what's, what's working, he's going to rejoice. But the rejoicing is not by the power of Paul. It's by the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ in and through him in the future tense. 
See, Paul is able to rejoice continually because that spirit is doing the rejoicing through him. See, it's not positive thinking. It's not because he read a Dale Carnegie book. It's not because he's one of those upbeat, hey, listen, uh, everything's good. I just wrecked my car, but it's all happy. See, there's some falseness that sits around in some of those things. Have you ever run into those people? You're just like going, really? Come on, man. I, I, you're, you're pressing the edges. That's not what Paul's doing. He's saying, listen. I'm rejoicing right now, and regardless of what happens in the future, I know that the Spirit of Christ is going to create a spirit of rejoicing in and through me, and I surrender to that. God can rejoice through me. The Spirit of Christ can rejoice through me. So regardless of what my life looks like, regardless of how I feel, regardless of whether I am sick, whether I am well, whether my car has crashed, whether my job is at risk, Regardless of that, I'm going to allow the Spirit of Christ to rejoice in and through me. See, it sort of, sort of comes home here at Thanksgiving, doesn't it? I mean, it's, a, it's an arbitrary date. Somebody set back in the 1800s. Arbitrary date. And that all of a sudden, in the middle of November... It's the third Thursday of November, right? Is that right? That we're supposed to celebrate and give thanks and be grateful for God's providence, for God's movement in our lives, for all that God has done. And we are, you and I are supposed to just be thankful. But yet sometimes in life, it, it arrives at a time when we're not thankful when there is illness, when there is heartache, when there is brokenness, when there is circumstances, when we can't rely on our own ability to be thankful. You see, we might find ourselves in this, quote, prison, that maybe not a literal prison, but maybe a literal prison. I don't know what your week holds. But I do know that even when life is not what I think it should be, I don't have to rely upon my ability to give thanks. See, when Thursday rolls around or whatever day you're celebrating Thanksgiving, it doesn't really matter. Because it's not my ability to rejoice. It's not my ability to give thanks. It's not my ability, because you understand the concept of thanksgiving and rejoicing and celebrating God's goodness and his action, is not dependent upon me. It's dependent upon my ability to allow God to act upon me and through me that I might not just rejoice right now, I can rejoice on Thursday or Friday or next month or next year. That's what Paul is speaking to the Philippians. Hey, listen, continue to pray for me. Hey, it's your, your prayer. Continue to pray. Because your prayers are allowing the Spirit of God to enact in me that I should continually continue to rejoice later on. Whether I live or whether I die, I can rejoice. Let's pray. Father, how grateful I am that you have placed and allowed me to be in a nation that celebrates your providence, your goodness, your faithfulness. That you have allowed me to experience your goodness throughout my life and throughout my nation and throughout my community. You're a good, good God, and we give you thanks. And we rejoice in what you're doing. But in this moment, we choose 
to rely upon the Spirit of Christ to come and rejoice through us in spite of what is not going right. Would you give us a willingness to be a people that just rejoice continually? Not just now, but would your Spirit do that in us later this month, later this year, in all the days of our lives? Would you form it in us, cause us to be willing to participate in your rejoicing through your Spirit? Everywhere we go, everything we're about, everyone we interact with. Would you spare us from the Dale Carnegie mentality and enact your spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ in our lives that we would naturally be grateful. Naturally, by the power of your spirit, living out rejoicing in the midst of your world, in the midst of our community. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.